for having me here. Actually, I have never think of myself like a biohacker. You know, it sounds so spacious. But I just think of myself that a girl with a lot of luck, that I found the magic of bacon before the death found me. And my name is Mie Westerdal, and today I'm going to talk about sugar addiction. I myself are an addict who lives in abstinence from sugar, including all kinds of wheat and alcohol and sweeteners and stuff like that. And before I start, I will go through today's agenda, just so you know what happens. First, I will just talk a little about myself and my journey, and then what is sugar addiction, and then how to overcome it. Yes, you know, like five basic tips. So I will not go down on the deep today, but just some tips on the road. Gains of a sugar-free living, and then I'm happy to meet all your questions. So about me, first I need to brag about my title. I have a Master of Science in Industrial Engineering and Management, uh, but that's not why I'm here. It's uh, just bragging, that title. <laughs> Actually, I'm a blogger. Uh, and I'm one of the more popular blog uh, low-carb blogger. Not time for modesty today. Uh, and I'm a columnist and a speaker. And my name is Elsie Hoefingenjören.se and you find me on Instagram and on my blog. And you can translate it to like the low-carb engineer, where I write about uh, sugar-free living in a sweet society, actually. Uh, but eight times a day, eight times a day, eight hours a day, I work as a national training manager for one of the world's biggest IT consultant company. It's a really fun job. I educate our uh, engineers in technical subjects as uh, Katia and Creo or coding or something. Yeah, uh, here we go then. Error. It was with that word my journey started. A cold day in January in 2010, I was standing on the scale to measure my body weight and were faced by this word, error. My body was too heavy for the scale to measure, which was up to 160 kilos. In that point, the whole world was falling apart in front of me. I was scared to death because the only thing I could think of was that I was going to die, of course. I had tried everything, but nothing worked in the long run. I have always been obsessed. Even as a little kid, I was overweight. Uh, today, I know why, and that's because I always prefer carbs, especially sugar. Here you see me as a nine-year-old girl. I know that many of us assume that the parents of an overweight child are feeding them with junk food. And I want you to all to think about your prejudice here, because that's not always the case. I am raised on a little island in the middle of the sea, so I didn't see any junk food restaurant until I was 15 years old. Uh, so for me, it was about something else. I had a sensitive brain. I always prefer the rice, pasta, bread instead of the meat or the sauce. And here, actually, I started my first diet. In this age, I tried the Weight Watchers for the very first time. First time of many times. I was too young, so my parents actually had to sneak me in. In the 90s, everybody was scared of fat. Uh, in that point of time, it was all about calories and workout. Everybody just told me to eat less and run more. The society, the school, my bullies. Everybody told me it was my fault that I had a lack of discipline and I was lazy. Combined with that, the cravings was driving me crazy. I uh, uh, I actually took money from my parents to buy candy, and I call in sick to school just to eat. Uh, here you see me as a teenager. Yeah, actually, I look like 30, but 
but I'm 13 on this picture. This is the result of 10 failed attempts on the Weight Watchers and as many as attempts on powder instead of food. Sometimes I could lose around 20 kilos, but uh, when my cravings got too big, I gained the lost weight and even more. I was so deep down in my addiction here. My brain was totally hijacked of sugar. It was all I could think about. My grades in school was falling. I was homesick in asthma and allergies, and I was haunted from my bullies. When I was turning 15, it got so bad that we had to go to trial and two of my bullies was convicted. In, sorry, in 2010, my life was terrible. I didn't have any grades. I almost lost my job. I was so big that I couldn't tie my own shoes. I, always, uh, I was always sick in asthma and allergies and my doctor told me that I had two years left to live. I had a big heart, my values was terrible, and my life was totally bad. So he suggested a gastric bypass. And actually, I said yes to that. Because I had really tried everything. I had tried every single diet every single powder on the market, and I was failing all over again, 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 again. So, um, but actually, something great happened that year. One day, I went to visit my parents for Sunday dinner. To my surprise, they looked thinner, and I asked them how they did it. And they were giving me this, you know, like, odd, fussy answer, and told me that, wait just right after the dinner and we will tell you. But the dinner was kind of odd as well, because the stew tasted cream and there were no potatoes. It was just, you know, cooked cauliflower. So, yeah, and I thought, oh my God, moms went crazy. You know, she was young in the 80s, so she's so terrified of fat. <laughs> but after the dinner, they told me an amazing story about a doctor that got skinny, just excluding the carbs and eating full fat food. So they asked me, me, what would you say if you never will have to measure your food again? Never have to be hungry again and your cravings, they will disappear. For me, that so sounded like a fairy tale, of course. But you know, what the heck, I had two years left to live. So uh, bacon or grains, not so hard choice. Uh, so I got home, threw all, all the carbs and started my new life. And the first 10 days was horrible. You know that one, you know, headache, cold sweat, stomach failure. But after 10 days, heaven opened for me. Now I had a lot of energy with which I used to raise my grades from no grades to straight A's. My asthma disappeared and I lost 40 kilos in one year. And you know what? I did it while only sitting in the sofa eating bacon. <laughs> you know, no workout, nothing, just sitting there, eat. It was wonderful. And all of a sudden, you know, when I was experiencing the greatness of full fat food, uh, I got a letter and it was an invitation for a gastric bypass. Uh, you know, the operation I signed up for a year earlier. Uh, but of course, I know, you know, bacon or operation. Not so hard choice either. So uh, I said clearly and uh, loud, no thanks. Uh, finally, my war was over. I had won. And my victory was spelled low carb, high fat. My victory were spelled bacon and butter. <laughs> but you know, as an... Uh, this is, you know, a short version of my story. And my top weight was around 170 kilos. And I had to 
look the death in the eye to turn my world around. But as an addict, just food isn't enough. Keto food is the baseline, of course, but uh, it's the most powerful tool to live free from sugar addiction. But it's not the whole answer. After a year on the keto diet, I started to getting relapses in sugar. It's a big challenge to have to handle your drug. An alcoholic can just, you know, stop drinking. We need to face our drugs every day. When we are celebrating, we are eating cake. When we are sad, we eat Ben and Jerry's. In today's society, we learn our kids to handle feelings and events with sweet food. And it takes time to relearn. It takes years to relearn. Today, I have eaten keto for 7.5 years, and I have lost 95 kilos. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm still suffering from addiction, of course. And like all brain diseases, it has its ups and its downs. Sometimes I don't notice my disease. Sometimes it's killing me with psychological cravings. I will now try to explain the disease a little deeper, and I will give you my best tips. The key point here, the issue here, is sugar addiction doesn't exist. So all the sugar addicted get treated first by di diet, and they will fail, and they will try again on a new diet, all over, over again. And when that are failing, we are going to put them on an eating disorder treatment, and they will fail there as well. Because you can't eat a little bit bread. It's like to say to an alcoholic, like, take just one glass of wine. It doesn't work that way. So the treatment is failing because I was in eating disorder treatment for five years. And yeah, you, you saw what that resulted in. <laughs> so when we are failing that treatment, what happened then? The society are cutting out healthy body parts just to keep us eating. But you know, surprise, the disease overweight isn't in the stomach, it's in the brain. Try to uh, cut out that one. <laughs> uh, so what is sugar addiction? Here you see criteria for addiction. This is for alcoholism. It's like alcohol <laughs> had hijacked your brain your entire life. Well, this is also a copy paste from my former life. Sugar was all I could think about. And I was hiding it, you know, I lied, I sneak with it. I had cravings. I needed more and more and more to feel satisfaction. And it impacts the rest of my life. You know, I called in sick. I didn't have any grades. I have failing relationships and all I wanted to do on my free time was eat. So, well, this is for alcoholics and this is for us, sugar addiction. It's the same disease, but we have different drug of choice. So, a day of a sugar addict. How does that look like? Well, you wake up with a hangover. Because if you eat a large amount of sugar, of course, you will be feeling a uh, hangover. Stomach pain, dizziness, cold sweat. And then you promise yourself, never again. And you know, in that point of time, you actually mean it. I promise myself I will never more eat like this. But hell, give it, you know, like a fika rast, and then you will try to pick up the drug again. So, uh, because you have so much anxiety, you will cancel work or school or meetings. Uh, and then the physical and mental anxiety is building up during the day. So then you take your tool, your only tool to survive. You start to plan. And then you get the drug. And then you take the drug. And then you promise yourself all over again that this I will never do again. But this goes day by day by day. And eventually this turning out to depression and suicidal thoughts. Sugar addiction, Dr. Mark Hyman says sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine. And you all know that if we have an addictive substitute, it's 
people that got sensitive brains. So of course we're going to have uh, addicted people. We need sugar to feel normal. We have periods of relapse. <coughs> Diet is, isn't enough. And it affects the dopamine systems, which gives us withdrawal symptoms when we quit. And actually, it's a permanent brain damage. So it's a chronic, deadly disease. You can't get rid of this disease, and even if you're been clean for 10 years. And you have to give up the drug forever. You can't, you know, you can't be free from alcohol if you're an alcoholic and, you know, starts to drink after 10 years. You know, like, autobahn in your head will all open again and you will be there all over again. Uh, eating behaviors. Not all of us are addicts, of course not. So you can divide our eating behaviors in three different categories. We have normal eating behavior, or as I call them, the aliens. You know, you're sitting on a, re a restaurant and the waitress com comes and asks, do you want dessert? And they say, no, thanks, I'm full. <laughs> It's like, what? How can you turn dessert down? It doesn't exist in my world. I don't understand that one. But they can, because they don't think food is special. And then we have the destructive eating behaviors. Uh, they can lose weight. Uh, yes, by changing the diet, because they can stick to that promise. Uh, they uh, become overweight because social pressure and wrong kind of food. Uh, and then we have me and my crew. The addictive eating behaviors. We totally lose control. And you know, it, it isn't about willpower, because our highest wish is never to eat again. And you can't be a little addicted, addicted. And actually, this is a deadly disease. So you uh, die because of overweight and the consequences of that. Or actually, you take your life. You commit suicide because this disease is driving you mad. It breaks you down little by little, so, so to say. But here's. My tools to uh, a sugar-free living, it's not all of my tools, but a, a few, the grounds. When I have my uh, other lectures, and in Swedish, <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, I know this Volvo English isn't that charming, but... <laughs> uh, this is my five best tools. Uh, here, so, sorry. Here you have a, a photo of my uh, breakfast. I ate a salad for breakfast. <laughs> no, but low carb, high fat is the baseline, is the most powerful tools, of course. Uh, because, you know, every carb is becoming like glucose in your blood, and that's my drug of choice, so I need to cut them off. And you know, you, you know all about this, so I don't need to get any deeper. Know your triggers. It's not only food that are triggering us. It's uh, feelings. For example, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. It's food, of course, like uh, dairies, or consistences, like crisps. Combinations, like tacos. And situations that we drag before, like in front of the TV or coffee shops, you know, Netflix and chill. <laughs> so uh, when you're facing one of your triggers, you need to be aware that your cravings will, you know, like be come up. What do you say? How much time do I have? Uh, I didn't see on the screen. I don't want. Fem over. Okay, good. <laughs> Okay, thank you, sorry. Uh, so, the triggers is, isn't only food. It's so much more than just food. Because uh, when we are facing one of these situations, it can um, trigger old habits or old ways to handle feelings. And we have one more tool. And you know, I'm so insecure about this English thing. So I thought that, well, maybe I can put in a video so I don't, doesn't have to talk as much. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, here we go. Måste jag trycka fram igen? Ja, där. Oj!
What causes, say, heroin addiction? This is a really stupid question, right? It's obvious, we all know it. Heroin causes heroin addiction. Here's how it works. If you use heroin for 20 days, by day 21, your body would physically crave the drug ferociously because there are chemical hooks in the drug. That's what addiction means. But there's a catch. Almost everything we think we know about addiction is wrong. If you, for example, break your hip, you'll be taken to a hospital and you'll be given loads of diamorphine for weeks or even months. Diamorphine is heroin. It's in fact much stronger heroin than any addict can get on the street because it's not contaminated by all the stuff drug dealers dilute it with. There are people near you being given loads of deluxe heroin in hospitals right now. So at least some of them should become addicts. But this has been closely studied. It doesn't happen. Your grandmother wasn't turned into a junkie by her hip replacement. Why is that? Our current theory of addiction comes in part from a series of experiments that were carried out earlier in the 20th century. The experiment is simple. You take a rat and put it in a cage with two water bottles. One is just water, the other is water laced with heroin or cocaine. Almost every time you run this experiment, the rat will become obsessed with the drugged water and keep coming back for more and more until it kills itself. But in the 1970s, Bruce Alexander, a professor of psychology, noticed something odd about this experiment. The rat is put in the cage all alone. It has nothing to do but take the drugs. What would happen, he wondered, if we tried this differently? So he built Rat Park, which is basically heaven for rats. It's a lush cage where the rats would have colored balls, tunnels to scamper down, plenty of friends to play with, and they could have loads of sex, everything a rat about town could want and they would have the drugged water and the normal water bottles. But here's the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, rats hardly ever use the drugged water. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. But maybe this is a quirk of rats, right? Well, helpfully, there was a human experiment along the same lines, the Vietnam War. 20% of American troops in Vietnam were using a lot of heroin. People back home were really panicked because they thought there would be hundreds of thousands of junkies on the streets of the United States when the war was over. But a study followed the soldiers home and found something striking. They didn't go to rehab. They didn't even go into withdrawal. 95% of them just stopped after they got home. If you believe the old theory of addiction, that makes no sense. But if you believe Professor Alexander's theory, it makes perfect sense. Because if you're put into a horrific jungle in a foreign country where you don't want to be, and you could be forced to kill or die at any moment, doing heroin is a great way to spend your time. But if you go back to your nice home with your friends and your family, it's the equivalent of being taken out of that first cage and put into a human rat park. It's not the chemicals, it's your cage. We need to think about addiction differently. Human beings have an innate need to bond and connect. When we are happy and healthy, we will bond with the people around us. But when we can't, because we're traumatized, isolated or beaten down by life, we will bond with something that gives us some sense of relief. It might be endlessly checking a smartphone, it might be pornography, video games, Reddit, gambling, or it might be cocaine. But we will bond with something because that is our human nature. The path out of unhealthy bonds is to form healthy bonds to be connected to people you want to be present with. Addiction is just one symptom of the crisis of disconnection that's happening all around us. We all feel it. Since the 1950s, the average number of close friends an American has has been steadily declining. At the same time, the amount of floor space in their homes has been steadily increasing. To choose floor space over friends. To choose stuff over connection. The war on drugs we've been fighting for almost a century now has made everything worse. Instead of helping people heal and getting their life together, we have cast them out from society. We have made it harder for them to get jobs and become stable. We take benefits and support away from them if we catch them with drugs. We throw them in prison cells, which are literally cages. We put people who are not well in a situation that makes them feel worse and hate them for not recovering. For too long, we've talked only about individual recovery from addiction. But we need now to talk about social recovery, because something has gone wrong with us as a group. We have to build a society that looks a lot more like Rat Park and a lot less like those isolated cages. We are going to have to change the unnatural way we live and rediscover each other. 
The opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. This video is a collaboration with Johan Hari, the author of the book Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs. He was very kind to work with us. So, uh, yeah, it's really, really simple to get rid of addiction. The only thing you have to do is change your entire life and everything in it. <laughs> Relationships are so important. If we don't bond with, with each other, we're going to bond with objects or processes. So when you feel down or want to eat or, yeah, something else that is destruct destructive, try to call someone, try to bond. And that maybe is the answer why the 12 Steps program is working, because we bond with people. Tool number four, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. You have to know what to eat today. It's really important. It's like today, you know, I have a lot of allergies and, you know, I need to take my responsibility to my uh, addiction. So uh, how did I solve the lunch? It's a big problem because I can't eat so much. The only thing I eat is butter, uh, meat and vegetables. So my solution was to uh, steal food from the hotel buffet in a plastic uh, bottle here. So <laughs> can, sorry. Uh, so well, sometimes the stealing is a responsibility. <laughs> I always carry my first aid kit. It's brain octane that keeps me alert. It's give me the safe, uh, same, uh, you know, like rush alert uh, as sugar, L-glutamine, and protein. This is the three supplements that I always carry with me, just to keep my sanity. Advantages, because, you know, to, to live a sugar-free life in a sweet society is hard. It's a really challenge. So you need to know what you gain of giving up sugar if you have a sugar addiction. The first uh, days, you feel that everything is pointless. It's no reason to live and nothing is fun and everything is gray. Then you need to know, what do I gain from this? And of course, self-esteem, because now you can trust yourself, you can trust your promises. You get a balanced mood, you don't uh, have any mood swings. Self-realization, you know, I was taking my graduation for 1.5 uh, years, uh, years ago. In this time, in one year and two months, I gone from a sales to a manager over Gothenburg area to the national manager. When you can handle your addictive brain, you can go how long as you want. Your family, you have energy and you need to bond with something else. So you bond with the people around you, not the objects or the processes. Of course, health and energy and freedom, of course. I'm not slave to the drug anymore. Before, my brain was totally hijacked of sugar. It was all I could think about. All my life was circling about sugar and how to get it. It's not that anymore. I'm free and I live a fantastic life with my bacon. <laughs> so my life today, I got from no grades to a master of science. I never had, uh, had to do a test again. Just did it once. I got a scholarship. I work as a, uh, on my school as a uh, teacher for um, students that were below me. I got better health, no asthma or uh, allergies. I got a fast career, as I told you before. I lost 95 kilos. <laughs> and I just want to point out that addiction is a strength if you learn to handle it. 
It's a power. It's self-realization because when you take the energy from your drug and put it to something that gives you something like career or family or free time or friends, your life is going to be wonderful. And with that said, thank you for listening to my Volvo English. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. Do you have any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, sweeteners, products with sweeteners? Uh, well, I don't like um, food with ingredients. I think that food are ingredients. So it feels really unnatural for me to eat that. So I, I don't eat it. I haven't been eating it for two years. Uh, so I want, you know, like, I really want to live close to nature in my food. Uh, so uh, no, and of course it triggers me. <laughs> That's the sad truth. Everything that tastes sweet, I spit out, actually. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, very inspiring. Do you eat fruit? No. Because fruit are carbs, but fruit are natural. An apple yeah. grows in Europe, in every country. Absolutely. It's so, it's very tasty. Yeah, I have heard. Just an apple, a, a, an organic apple. Just take it out from the tree. I'm not challenging you, I'm just asking because I love apple. Yeah, well, I understand and, and, that. And the brand. Well, I eat just 20 grams of carbs each, each day. So it doesn't fit my food. Uh, I, 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 I will not, you know, say that everybody needs just 20 gram carbs per day, wah, wah, you know, but I need it because I'm a sugar addict. So I need to push it down as low as I can. It's my drug of choice. So, uh, you know, that we have different bodies. We have different biochemistry and you need to find your level. I, for example, I do intermittent fasting. I just eat two times a day or sometimes just one because I don't want to face my drug. I just want to live. So I need those tools to keep my sanity, actually. Okay, and uh, one more last question. So yeah. you said you tried it all, you tried all kind of diets and none of them seem to work. So what are the biggest misconceptions that are out there that don't work? Well, it's about willpower today. Mm -hmm. Discipline, laziness, it's my fault. It's my, as an individual, it's my fault. Nobody takes responsibility. We op you know, operate child today. We, we, we cut, cut out, you know, like healthy body parts from our child. It's so, you know, I almost start to cry when I think about it. We can destroy life because we don't admit sugar addiction. We need to treat every disease for what it is. We need to admit it. And it's not about willpower, you know, even, you know, I can, I have fantastic grades. I have fantastic career, but I can't control a single dry cookie. You know, it's not about willpower. It's about, about the brain disease. So um, I think that it, I hope that within years that is um, known as addictive. I hope so. All right, thank you very much. And thank you too. I think on this powerful note. Thank you. <laughs>